Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to the United Church of Gainesville, where no matter who you are or where you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. One of the ways in which we like to express our welcome is by celebrating our birthdays. Does anyone have a birthday today or this week? Any birthdays on this side? Oh, it's Carol's birthday. Jackson, is it your birthday? Nope. Any birthdays on this side? Oh, hi, what's your name? Adeline. Adeline. Beautiful. And how about on this side, any birthdays? Well, let's sing happy birthday to Carol and to Adeline. Huzzah! Before we get our service started, I have a few brief announcements for you, but there are many more printed in our bulletin. Please make sure that you check those out. First off, the Blood Mobile is here. There is no better way to celebrate Holy Week than by giving the gift of life. If you would, and if you could, please donate blood. Um, there is a wonderful seminar coming up later this morning with Daniel Webster. Always good to be with Daniel. That will take place over in Reimer Hall. And we have a minor blip in our bulletin. We are hosting a book launch for Star Bradbury later this afternoon. Your bulletin says it begins at 1. It actually begins at 2. And there is more about that in our announcements as well. Well, we begin the turn to Easter Sunday by stepping in to Holy Week. And this is the gritty week of our faith. We begin with the joy and the jubilation of Palm Sunday, which will take place in just a minute, but not yet. But then we turn to the hard stuff in our life of faith. We'll talk about that a little bit more in this service ahead. But as we consider this Holy Week, I begin by wondering what it is that you mourn for. You know, we all experience aspects of sadness, death, grief in our hearts. And I'm wondering, what are you holding in yours? You don't need to share because this is a pretty private thing. But it's important to consider these things. And it's an important piece of our human experience. So I hope that you know that when you join a community like this, when you come together with these people, we work together to lessen that load, to bear each other's burdens. And that is a real blessing. And so I give thanks today for looking at all these wonderful faces around us. And I hope that you will take just a moment to appreciate all the people around here, how lucky we are. Now, if you watch the news, Chances are good. There is a significant piece of mourning taking place almost every single day in our news cycle. And if you ever have doubts, I encourage you to look no further than the power of this community when you are seeking hope. Just yesterday, there were over 100 children and families from our community here using our entire campus for a free sensory-friendly, trauma-informed, and accessible fair for anyone that wanted to come. And it was incredible. It was amazing. Lindsay Telg and Talia put together this incredible program with 24 occupational therapy students leading all sorts of games. And my favorite was Seminar B had been transformed into Elsa's chill room. The lights were off. There were Christmas lights, soft music was playing, a giant mat and bean bags were on the floor. It was amazing. But there was a dance party on the other end of the church. It was absolutely incredible. So have no doubt that this church serves a crucial and important role in our community. And we are lucky to have you as members supporting it. So that is where I find hope. 
that and in the gathered community that came together to celebrate the life of Becky Ganaw yesterday. The celebration of our friendship group, which Becky's son, Brady, was part of. The celebration of gathering together to share some deep thoughts and beautiful ideas and to give thanks, which is ultimately what it all comes down to. Giving thanks, hearts with gratitude, full of love. So thank you for being here. And thank you for supporting this congregation. And I invite you now to take a deep breath, to be present to this moment, and to give thanks for what a beautiful day this day is. Welcome to worship. So as I said, today is the first day of Holy Week. That is the day, today is the day that Jesus and his friends, after having this tremendous preaching tour all around the region, decided that it was time to head up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Now remember, Jesus and his friends all were Jewish. And the thing to do was to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. But... Because Jesus had become so popular with his teaching, his preaching, his healing, the amazing works that he was doing, a crowd gathered to welcome him into Jerusalem. So I would like to invite any children who would like to, to come forward to be part of our crowd for the Palm Parade. So come on down, everyone. Yes. Now Matthew told the story in this way. He said, A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of Jesus followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, 
Usually we sing a Hosanna song, but I wanted to shake it up a little bit and get you to increase your heart rate as well. So we have a little song that goes, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. I would like you to do a little call and response. So, on our first round, if you're a low voice, you sing the hallelujahs. If you're a high voice, you sing the praise ye the lords. And we'd like you to stand up when it's your turn to sing. And pay attention because I will have further directions for you as we finish that. All right, Palm Paraders, are you ready? Yes. All right, it's okay, you just wave it around. Here we go. All right, my friends, you can take off and low voices. Here we go. Hallelujah, 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 praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 praise ye the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, praise ye the Lord. All right, that was really good. Now we're going to do left Side, left side, we'll sing hallelujah. Right side, we'll sing praise ye the Lord. Yes, I got those reversed for me, but not for you. Are you ready? Left side, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Tall people, you know who you are. You are the hallelujahs. Short people, you know who you are. You are the praise ye the lords. Are you ready? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Young people, young in body or in heart. Young people, you are the hallelujahs. Old people or elders or however known in this, you are the praise ye the lords. Are you ready? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. so much. <clears throat> Children, go forth in blessing our friends, celebrating the joys of Hosanna, which means God with us. So blessings to you all. Thank you so much. I think that's my favorite Palm Parade ever. That was fun. That was fun. <laughs> Will you join me in the responsive invocation this morning from the 11th chapter of John? With the heart pounding rush and the thrilling crush of the crowds in the busy streets, we sweep away our worries and wants and join our voices to the chorus of hosannas all around. But in the shadow of our eyes, As we make our way to the temple courtyard,
The shouts and smiles falter a step, slow back, tone down, and cast murmurs among the Roman soldiers and temple guards. On Spiritus Sanctus. For a moment there, we even believed in God's holy reign, knew the day we would overcome, and felt a kinship and kindness with and toward all creation. The planets aligned before the shouting began, but elation gave way to trepidation as we dispersed among the marketplace, and we wondered how long this wayshower would last, saying such things as give us hope in these days shrouded in fear. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Behold the Lamb of God, Agnus Dei, who takes away the sins of the world. I invite you to rise if you are not too tired from our exercises this morning and to join in singing verses one and two of Gather Us In. are the prayers specific to our gathered community this morning. First, prayers of joy and thanksgiving, as Andy mentioned, for the spring fling yesterday that provided a wonderful respite and moments of joy for over 100 families from our community. So thank you for being a place of welcome that strives to be an accessible one for all. We are continuing to pray for Judy Munsell, who had a knee replacement surgery on March 27th. If you are able to provide a meal for Judy while she heals, uh, there is a link both in the online worship bulletin or you can check in at the office. We, as we mentioned last week, are continuing to hold Priscilla Aronson's family in our prayers with deep grief for her niece who died by suicide last week. We, of course, give great thanks for sharing in the life of Becky Gana and in whose life we celebrated yesterday. Prayers of healing and care are asked for Roger Adam Duncan, who is the son of my mentor, Reverend Karen Barker Duncan, who is seriously ill. We pray with astonishment and grief and in sorrow 
over the news that comes to us of a former UCG member, Tim Smith, who was killed in his home last week. We are, as always, shocked and in pain when we hear of violence that permeates our lives, the lives of our loved ones and the lives of those who are marginalized. We pray peace, we pray healing, and we pray in our grief. Let us take now some time in silence to hold these and all others that we carry with us in this time. Compassionate spirit, our hearts break for all that we have lost. We are disoriented by grief, both personal and global. We refuse to harden our hearts by swallowing our cries. God with us, guide us in the ways of soulful mourning. Move with us through the flow of grief. Ground us in the shared experience of sorrow. Console us with hope for connection and joy, even amidst loss. When Jesus witnesses Mary weeping over her brother Lazarus, Jesus' spirit was greatly disturbed and he was moved. Let us live into that legacy, moved with compassion for the bereaved and who works toward the ways of life with us. We gather ourselves in the spirit of compassion and solidarity. For we know sorrow and joy dance together in our lives, and when we close off to one, we close off to the other. We recommit to co-creating a world unafraid of heartfelt mourning, where we offer one another not only consolation, but actions to alleviate suffering. For we know O oh God, you are with us in our grief, and you are with us as we tend the pathways to joy. Amen. In just a moment, our choir will sing for you in paradisium, which in English translates to into paradise. This is an antiphon from the traditional Latin liturgy of the Western Church's Requiem Mass. It's sung by the choir, usually as a loved one is taken out of the church. The text of the In Paradisium with or without the Gregorian melody is included in musical settings often of the Requiem Mass as it is in this morning's in the set uh, that is set by the composer Gabriel Faure. And the text reads, May the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs receive you at your arrival and lead you to the holy city, Jerusalem. May choirs of angels receive you, and with Lazarus, once a poor man, may you have eternal rest. Choir, come on forward.
Our scripture reading today is adapted from the Gospel of John and tells of the raising of Lazarus. Lazarus was ill, so his sisters, Mary and Martha, sent word to Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when he heard it, Jesus did not go to him. Instead, he stayed two days longer. Then he said, Let us go to Judea again, for our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. His disciples refused. Rabbi, they said, those in Bethany have threatened you with death if you return. Therefore, you must not go to Lazarus. But he went anyway. When he arrived, he learned that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and met him. She told Jesus, If you had been here, he would not have died. But Jesus said, He will rise again. Martha returned to her sister and told her that Jesus would like to see her. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but when Mary went out to him, those with them mourning in the house went with her also. When Mary arrived, she knelt before him and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and those who had come with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. Where have you laid him? He asked. And when they showed him Lazarus' tomb, Jesus wept. Jesus ordered them to remove the stone from the tomb, and when they did, he looked up to heaven and prayed aloud, and then with a loud voice cried out, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out, still bound with strips of cloth, his face still wrapped. Jesus told them, Unbind him, let him go. We came to Gainesville in 1975. We moved into a house in a live oak gallery. One of the, over the next 40 years, the house grew and changed as our family grew and changed. In 2016, we decided to move to a from, to move from our house to a planned living community for older adults. And this poem was written in about the transition from my home of 40 years uh, to this planned community. A life's past is full of history. So many stories to tell. A life's future is all mystery. We see our dreams casting a spell. Change will always put us to the test. We know that all things pass away. But rather than allowing a desired rest, it forces us to cling to just one more day. This world exists forever in transition, never able to remain the same. We gradually accept changes to inner cognition that in the end, nothing is abstained. Realize the illusions of the future yet unborn, living now, that alone is enduring and real. Nothing grows to completion without its thorns, and life does not return to where it was despite the zeal. My, uh, <clears throat> my office phone doesn't ring as often as it once did. So when it does, I'm qu- quick to pick it up. If it rings, that means that whoever is calling is 
gone through the trouble to find the church line and they reach Lisa or Shauna, who are our gatekeepers with a phone. Now, they are generally very good gatekeepers. Lisa can target a salesperson by their intake of breath before they even say hello. <laughs> Shauna is a more trusting sort, but still very good at keeping the carpet baggers away. So when the phone rang, I rolled to answer it, only to hear when I said hello, hello, is Pastor Batchman in? <laughs> Nope, I said. He's dead. <laughs> it felt good. <laughs> I'm not dead yet, but my time with you as your pastor is drawing to a close. And to me, it feels like a little death. It's a strange place to be. I knew the world would turn as soon as my announcement had been made. I knew decisions would have to be made without me. I knew the emotional journey would be tough, and it has been. I knew all of that, and I'm okay with that. What I didn't realize was how much my experiences with death and grief and mourning would give me heartfelt reassurance that in this time of transition, everything will be okay, both for me and for you. And I'm glad for that. The great predicament of this human experience is learning to cope with all of the sadness and all of the sorrow that is part of life. From an early age, we learned that sometimes life is complicated. Life can be sad and complex, and sometimes we can't always get what we want. As we learn to cope with the little disappointments throughout our lives, we train our brains to accept the things that make no sense or stir up unfelt emotion. Like when you didn't make that basketball team, or when your friends let you down, or when your first pet died, or when your parents separated. We learn from all these little deaths, and we develop skills to help cope. All these small deaths prepare us to face the genuine grief and true sorrow that one day will come from living a life of love. And that is the one thing that connects all of humanity. We all know that our loved ones will die one day, and so will we. Someday, a sadness so big will arrive, and it will take all that we have just to survive. Living with grief may be the most important lesson we can learn. It's good that we have Easter stories like this to help show us the way. The story of the raising of Lazarus is very unique in the Gospels. It only occurs in the Gospel of John, and clearly it serves as a foreshadowing event. Now you should know that I have greatly sanitized the biblical passage that you heard today. Poet and podcast host Padre Gotuma once wrote that the library of writings and religious texts has never lost its fascination for me. It almost did once but I accidentally began to read religious books as art, not authority, and the wonder opened up for me again. That is how I feel about the Gospel of John. I have spent years negotiating my relationship with this last Gospel written, and we've finally come to a mutual agreement to appreciate the art and not be appalled by the theology, but still, there are a few things you should know. First, the Gospel of John was penned almost 200 years after the death of Jesus. Now that is a very long time. And like all of the other Gospels, there is a point that the authors are trying to make to prove that, uh, uh, to prove, uh, uh, 
certain beliefs that they have about the life and the ministry of Jesus. Now, in modern day terms, John is what I would call a traditionalist. It is the only gospel that traces Jesus' lineage all the way back to the dawn of creation. And John is the only book in the entire Bible that refers to Jesus as the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God. For spiritual traditionalists like John, our human awareness and our mortality came at great cost. It was that first bite from that fruit of the tree of good and evil that supposedly opened our eyes to the spectrum of the human experience. Suddenly the shame and the pride, the hate and the healing, the lust and the love and the beauty and the sorrow all came to our awareness as a result of that action. Now, according to the ancient story told in Genesis, as humans stood there exposed in our nakedness, we were marked with the sin of disobedience, a sin that according to some Christian traditions would require the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God, to be sacrificed on the altar of man to make us acceptable in the eyes of the Lord again. In that story, we are told that we were exiled from paradise and we would stay away until we could atone for our ancestral sin. For some, that is the central theme of this holy week, sin and sacrifice, a deific atonement, debt paid to a vengeful God. But I am not a traditionalist and I have never believed that we were born broken. I believe that we are born beloved. And I have never believed that we are exiled from God's love nor the beauty of creation. On the contrary, I believe that we are a central part of God's wondrous creation and our awareness of life's mortality should serve to make us better stewards and caretakers of creation. And I believe that we are born beautiful, just as we are, just as you will be. And I believe that there is not a single thing that we could ever do that could separate us from the love of God. Nor do I believe that God is a child abuser who would willingly sacrifice their son as atonement for someone else's transgressions. And to that, I will say, Hosanna. Now for me, the knowledge of the frailty of life is a blessing. It's not a curse. In the darkness, we come to know the power of the light. As the poet Bill said, change will always put us to the test. We know all things pass away, but nothing grows to its completion without thorns, and life does not return where it was, despite the zeal. To fully inhabit the light of life, we must also inhabit the dark. The Gospel of John, when viewed through its artistic light, does something that none of the other Gospel stories are willing to do. John's Gospel gives us a God who weeps, and in doing so, gives us perhaps the most important insight to take from the entire Christian story. From the wombs of our birth to the tombs of our death, life has always been a delicate dance between shadow and light. And as the only entity on earth blessed with the knowledge of both, it is up to us to embrace both so that we might be made whole. If we have hearts willing to embrace our eventual demise, we can more fully experience the full spectrum of this life and call it a blessing. But to do so, we must accept a few things. First, life is a mystery. Some things we will never know. 
friend recently asked me my thoughts on the afterlife. And I don't know. I don't know what happens when we die. But I have faith that it's going to be okay. And I have also come to fully embrace and live into the quote of St. John of Chrysostom that we often use in memorial services here when we say, those whom we love and lose are no longer where they once were. They are now wherever we are. If you've loved someone special, have you ever seen them somewhere around town? I just saw Kathy Keithley two days ago. Kathy Keithley, who died recently. She was watering my neighbor's lawn. A few weeks ago, I saw my mother exit the sanctuary. I wasn't preaching. But I had to do, I had to do a quadruple take when I saw her leave. It was amazing. It was beautiful. It was mysterious. Both memory and love and sadness live on in my heart. Richard Rohr said, if you are not trained in a trust of both love and mystery, and also have some ability to hold anxiety and paradox, all of which allow the divine entry into the soul, you will not proceed very far on the spiritual journey. He says, Jesus praises faith even more often than love, because faith is that patience with mystery that allows you to negotiate the states of life and move toward wholeness and love. Second, and this is a tricky one, don't ignore your grief. People who say there are stages of grief are wrong. Grief is a hot, soupy, sticky mess that can have you laughing hysterically one minute and uncontrollably weeping the next. When you're in it, just be in it and don't ignore it. I tried that once. When my father died, I had one of the most productive years of my life here. It was awful. I threw myself into work, thinking I had a job to do, and I found that the busyness allowed me to distract myself from the chasm of loneliness and isolation that I was creating in my real life. With my mother's death, I knew better, and I had a little ritual that I would do. I would intentionally sit with my grief. She died on a Thursday. And every Thursday after, I would light a candle and I would sit with it. I would write in my journal or sometimes simply watch it burn. But I would sit with my grief so that it wouldn't go untended. Tend to your grief. Grief never goes away. It sits for me like an eight-pound shot put on the top two ventricles of my heart. It's always there pressing down, and sometimes I can take it out and consider it, ask it questions, be curious about it and where it's tugging at my heartstrings these days, and sometimes it talks back to me, and I can hear it when it gives me guidance or comfort or names my sorrow. My grief is part of me, and that's a beautiful thing because it means that I have loved and I have been loved, and that's a blessing. One day, the grief doesn't weigh so heavy. One day, life opens up a little bit and possibilities start to trickle in. Dr. Serene Jones says this is moving from grief into mourning. She says, moving from grief to mourning creates the necessary space for you to make sacred the pain so that the rest of your life can be transformed by it. We are set free by telling the truth, and that truth-telling propels us to the future through love. And there it is again, that foundational emotion that we all long for, that we all crave, love. But 
love evolves as we move through grief. James Baldwin once said that love takes off the masks that we fear that we cannot live without and know that we cannot live within. That is why it is so vital that Jesus weeps, not sniffles, not cries, a tear doesn't trickle down his holy cheek, he weeps. Here is a God who finally understands us, invites us to places of extreme vulnerability and emotion, and encourages us to inhabit our vulnerability and our fragility with courage, with compassion, and sorrow, and love. His love for this man and his love for his friends makes him have this strong emotional reaction. John would have us believe that Jesus called Lazarus from the tomb to prove to the world that he has the powers of God. But for me, God's great passion was on full display the minute the floodgates flew open and Jesus wept for his friend. Here is a God that I can believe in. And here is a love that I will invest in, a love that comes to light in the darkness and transforms heartbreak to hope, a love that provides comfort for those who mourn and reassurance to all of us that even in the great mystery of tomorrow, there is still plenty to hope for today. Soon after he raises Lazarus from the dead, the Holy Week events go into full motion. They go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Jesus causes so much commotion that he garners the attention of the temple priests and the Roman guards, which lead to their terrible conclusion. But I like to think that sometime between Lazarus' resurrection and Jesus' arrest, they had a chance to sit down and talk with each other to relive their friendship and recall great memories. Enjoy just a moment's respite, a cup of tea, and delight in each other's presence. Because that is what he does. That is what he does on his last night with his friends when they gather together in that little room for a little party. his final teaching. Let loose the masks that you hide behind. Break yourselves open to one another because this is where the actual fruits of the kingdom come from. And pour out your troubles and pour out your pain into a shared cup a cup that can be passed from hand to hand, from heart to heart, celebrating the gift that it is to have people with whom we can be broken in a world that needs us to pour out our love. For it is in pouring ourselves out for one another where we know the true gifts of God, light in the dark times, love in the gathering, and hope in the faith that all will be well. All will be well. All manner of things will be well. Amen. Friends, I hope that you will join me at this table of sacred belonging, celebrating the blessings of being broken open to one another, the love that we have shared and poured out for one another. There's been no greater honor for me than this, to live our lives in shared community, to be belonged by you, and to have you belonged by me. That is the true blessing of this life. So all are welcome to partake. There are no boundaries around these tables. And when you do, do so in sacred community. We'll pass the bread down the aisles and then the cup, and we invite you to take your bread
to dip it in the cup and then to pass it, or better yet, to hold it for the next person in service to them. So, serving to all of them on behalf of all of you, please join me in the breaking of this bread and this cup. Blessed be. Here we will take the wine and the water. Here we will take the bread of new life. Here you shall call your sons and your daughters. Call us anew to be salt for the earth. Gather us the wine of compassion. Give us to eat the bread that is you. Nourish us well and teach us to fashion lives that are holy and hearts that are true. Not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away. Here in this place, through light is shining, now is the kingdom and now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever, gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, all peoples together, fire of
Please join me in prayer. Oh God, as we gather together in this gritty week of faith, we pause and give thanks for this table and for this community. How lucky we are. May we have hope in our hearts that will survive in the difficult days. May we find faith in the future, recognizing the majesty of the mystery. And may we know joy in the places where we feel sorrow. And may we be aware of our sorrow as we experience life's joys. For all of this joy and for all of this sorrow, we give thanks. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit or in both and join together in the singing of our final song this morning. Thank you to Philip, Talia, Bromley, our incredible choir. Wasn't that an amazing piece? Yeah. <clears throat> Bill, for your beautiful poetry and our BPM for doing such a wonderful job serving our communion. We have not one, not two, not three, not four, but five opportunities for you to celebrate during this Holy Week. You can join us on Monday, Thursday for Monday, Thursday, 6.30 here can join us for Good Friday, also here, also at 6.30. And then on Easter, we have three different services for you. An 8 a.m. contemplative spirit that will be out in our garden, and then a 9.15 and 11.15 service. We look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, go forth with this blessing. And now may God go with you. May God walk where you walk, guide where you must make choices, comfort where you hurt, and surprise you by God's continued love for you and what you are and what you do. And now that the worship has ended, let the service begin. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.